rejoice evermore. Rejoice shows up 186 times in the Bible. And all rejoice is, it's just joy with a redo. That's what rejoice is. The first time that it shows up is in Leviticus chapter number 23, verse number 40. You don't have to turn there. But you remember when we were in Leviticus 23 and we ran all the feasts of the Lord? The Feast of Tabernacle Feast, and we went through all of that, and we, we, we parked on there for a little bit, um, especially when we were going through the, the trumpets. At, toward the end of that chapter, then the Lord, for the first time, that shows up, and he says, rejoice. And it's like seven days, all they do is rejoice. Imagine that, just, just carving out seven days out of the week, out of your life, or out of the month. It would be a whole week, and all you're going to do is just rejoice. That'd be pretty neat. That'd be pretty neat. We, we might, Americans might just be too busy for that. I don't have time to rejoice. I'm too busy working. Let's go back to First Chronicles. First Chronicles. First Samuel, Second Samuel, then you get to the Kings, and then you get to Chronicles. And let's look at uh, verse First Chronicles, chapter number sixteen. First Chronicles chapter number 16, verse number eight. The Bible says, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works, glory ye in his holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. It's a it's a it's a Thanksgiving psalm. If you look at verse number seven of chapter 16, it says then on that day, David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord. And man, I'll tell you, that's pretty meaty just to give thanks. Sing unto him psalms unto him glory in his name. That's something that will make your heart rejoice is meditating on what and who the Lord is. Sometimes we need to turn off. The news, sometimes we need to turn off kind of the news feed that's cycling in our own mind and just rejoice in the Lord. Look at verse number 31. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Look at verse number 32. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice. How does the earth rejoice? How, do, how does the earth and the fields rejoice for the Lord? That's pretty cool, isn't it? I'll tell you what, when he comes back and he sets up his kingdom, they are going to be, it's going to be, it, it's going to be a, a, a big, big time of rejoicing. Jesus comes as the ruling king. But anyway, even his creation rejoices over him. Go over to Second Chronicles, chapter number six. Second Chronicles six, verse number 41. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, into thy resting place, thou, and the ark of thy strength. Let, the, let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let thy saints rejoice in goodness. Now, we're not in the Old Testament, but you can see saints mentioned here, and they rejoice. God's people rejoice over who he is. Look at um, 2 Chronicles chapter number 20. 2 Chronicles chapter number 20 and verse number 27. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. They got a victory over their enemies and that is a reason to rejoice in the Lord. Let me ask you something. This week, did God give you victory over something? Yes. Rejoice in that. Too many times we just move on to the next thing or we park on it a little bit. And it's great that we have prayer requests. We need them. We need to pray. We'll get to that in a minute. But how about some rejoice requests? Now, we can't do seven days like they did in Leviticus, but it might be a good idea to do seven minutes. 
when I was in New Jersey, we had visited this church. We went there for um, a little bit of time, and they made a big to-do um, before the preacher would come out and preach. They had the singing, the music, and then this one guy, he'd come out, and he'd come behind the pulpit. I'm not saying we're going to do this. I just, I mean, I, don't, I mean, they made it work. I just don't think I can make it work. He wanted to give the Lord a hand clap. So every Sunday, that guy spent time getting the people standing and giving the Lord a hand clap. <laughs> now, I don't think I can pull that off, but the point I'm making is they put an effort and an emphasis on rejoicing. And I think a lot of times we're, we're too independent, fundamentally Baptist in our thinking, we got to get everything so right. We got to get every peg in every right little hole that we forget. Well, there's a hole over here that we got to get a peg in. That's rejoice. We should be excited and happy about who the Lord is and what He did for us. It's it's good to rejoice in Him and have and have a good time. Um, how do we rejoice? Let's look at a few of those. Now it's mentioned 186 times. We're not going to run all the verses, but we'll just run a few and. And spend some time rejoicing as we do it. <clears throat> Psalm 2. Psalm 2, verse number 11. <clears throat> How should we rejoice? Psalm 2, verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and, we, and rejoice with trembling. How do we rejoice? Well, the Bible tells us in Psalm 2 with a bit of trembling. The reason people mock God, the reason there's a monk, dedicated to those that live a reprobate queer lifestyle is because they don't fear God and they don't tremble at God and God's wrath and God's law, and God's commandments and God's character or anything with God in it. But they got a month. <laughs> they got a month with a symbol that they stole from the Bible. And so it just right. tells me, the word is mighty. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. I mean, how, how do we rejoice with trembling? Psalm 2, with, with some trembling. Go over to Psalm chapter 5. Psalm chapter 5, verse 11. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. Because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. How do we rejoice according to Psalm 5? With shouting. Yeah, Jesus. People can shout and holler and scream and paint their face green and red and blue and go to a ball game. And they'll scream and shout for somebody running around in tights. But they won't shout for God. It's okay to say amen in church. Look, I know we're a small church. Works a little bit better when there's more people. But the idea is we can shout for God. Amen. We, we can say amen. We can say praise God. We can say hallelujah. You can glory to God. You, whatever it is or however it works out in your life, you can shout for God. <laughs> You, 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 you can. Amen. It's, amen. Amen. We're showing our true colors of how small we really are. It's like, you know. We'll be like Gideon. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of noise that people make. We're going to go work and do this tournament this weekend. And it's a lot of noise all day. Because little Billy's going to fight and compete. And little Billy's mom and dad and coach are going to just go all out amen on that thing. And then somebody's boyfriend's going to compete or somebody's husband's going to compete. And they're going to go all out with the shouting and the cheering and, and they come on, you know. And then we come to church and it's like, oh, we get to go serve Jesus this week. Yeah, well. Well, what's the next verse? <laughs> we don't get ex we don't get that excited about living for God as we do for 
other things that we so shout and celebrate. And I'm as guilty of it as much as you are. I want to be more all out for God. I'm not saying don't shout for your little nephew that's trying to kick a soccer ball in the net. Shout for him. Give him some encouragement. I'm not against that, and that's not the point of me mentioning it. The point of me mentioning it is we don't apply that same shouting to our Christian walk with God. Oh, yeah, it's God. Yeah, we got to go to church. It's Sunday. It's midweek. It's Let's get some shouting. How do we rejoice with trembling, with shouting? Psalm chapter 9, verse number 2 says, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. How do we rejoice? With singing and with being glad. Why is it? To me, from my perspective, this is my opinion. Why is it that the older saints seem to, as a generation, be more glad and happy about things? I mean, they're old. <laughs> you know, it's like their, their hip hurts, their knee hurts, their ankle hurts, their elbow hurts, their neck hurts, their eyes hurt. Everything hurts and they're old. What are you so happy about? That's what the verse is talking about. Because they're keyed into God. And so to me, it seems like the older saints get a hold of this verse or these principles about singing to the Lord, about being glad, because they're just settled in the peace that comes from Jesus. And you could make the argument that they have more problems than younger people when it comes to their health, when it comes to the medical things, when it comes to the ability to do all of the things that we can do in our 20s and 30s and 40s. And they got a hold of some gladness. What do you have to be glad for, Mike? Everything on your body hurts. Yeah, but I got Jesus Christ. It's the perspective on how you live and who you live for that will bring you gladness and will bring you singing and will bring you shouting and some trembling. Psalm chapter number 13. Verse number five, the Bible says. But I have trusted in thy mercy, my heart shall rejoice in, thou, in thy, thy salvation. How do we rejoice? It has to be from the heart. That's what Psalm 13, 5 says. And do you know why? In order to look, none, none of these mega preachers are going to tell me anything I don't already know. So I've ran two very successful businesses, one I've sold, one I'm running right now. We've survived COVID. We're going to, by the grace of God, make it on. Amen. I know how to build a business. Praise God. He has taught me a lot of things, and I've had a lot of good teachers. Do you think it would really be hard for me to build a big church? <laughs> no. You figure out what people want. You give them what they want. You create a marketing machine around that, and then there it goes. How else do you get a bunch of people in a room to fight all day and not kill each other by the end of it and then want to come back again? Marketing, giving somebody a good product, giving somebody a good service, treating them well, giving them what they want. You know what this world wants? What the world has to offer. So all I have to do is create a design, a marketing program to be able to bring people in based on what their flesh wants. What do guys want to see? Girls. Well, you get some girls up here to dance around. Put them in, in some yoga tights, and there you go. If you want some fellows to come, you put some young girls in the ads, and you, you send it out, and then, you know, vice versa, and you get a big band going, and, you know, it's it's not really Led Zeppelin. It's just kind of Led Zeppelin light, you know. It's not really the top 40. It's top 40 light. I don't even know what the real bands are today, but – it's not hard to do. Right. And they all do it and they all get a bunch of people. But you know what isn't in their heart? 
the joy and the gladness of the Lord. And if you were to take that away, do you know how many people they would have returned the next Sunday? That would be about 20 to 30 percent of those people. Right. Because the vast majority are there because mom needs a break. Watch my kid and have pretzels to clown, juggle balls and have a hula hoop and serve them Kool-Aid and pretzels. <laughs> Take away free daycare and what do you have? <laughs> right? What do you got? <laughs> Nothing. Because they don't have God in their hearts. That's how we rejoice in God. It has to be from the heart. And small churches or big churches, the number doesn't matter. But I'm not going to go after big numbers at the expense of what God wants for his New Testament church. If God brings us 300 or 400 or 500 people, praise the Lord. But I'm not going to go after 500 people with rock music, throwing out the King James Bible and doing whatever else the world wants us to do. Right. Does that make sense? A lot. Because we all want more people. But we don't want more people for the wrong reasons, because all that does is give us the wrong people. And the next thing you know, we're just like any other modern apostate reprobate church that has a female preacher, a modern version, and just go on down the line. The whole thing's a circus act. Modern Christianity and churchianity in America, by and large, is Barnum and Belly Circus. I mean, that's, that's what it is. Come to the circus, kids. Everybody loves, everybody loves the circus. It's going to be the death of them. All right, that was quite fun. Psalm 32, let's look at one more. Psalm 32, verse number 11. Uh, just reiterates what we talked about. Be glad in the Lord. Too many people are glad in the world. And rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy. All ye that are upright in heart. Kind of sums it up, what we've been talking about, about being from the heart. Now, let's go over to the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> the book of Proverbs. We'll get chapter number five first. We looked at how do we rejoice. Now look at who do we rejoice with. Proverbs chapter number five, verse number 18. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. This is for spouses or those that are going to have a spouse in the future. There is rejoicing when you first meet. Don't let that rejoicing fade away. Continue to find ways to rejoice. Now, it might not be what you used to, to do, you know, run five miles and go to the, the park for a picnic all day, and, 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 you know, fish all day, whatever it is, whatever it is that you did in your youth that you rejoiced over with your spouse, but the rejoicing shouldn't go away. So who do you rejoice with? Wife of your youth. Whoever God puts you with, he puts you with. Don't lose the, the joy. Don't lose the rejoicing. Proverbs 23. Find fun things to do. <clears throat> it's easy to find, you know, you just figure out, well, she likes that. I don't like to do that. He likes that. I don't like to do that. Well, you don't want to. Try to find joy in taking your wife out. Try to use a table saw or a chop saw or a chainsaw. She's probably not going to have a good time doing that. But there's other things you can find. The idea isn't to make her rejoice in what you like to do that she doesn't have any interest in and vice versa. Try to find some common ground. In other words, get back to how you used to be in the beginning when you were young. It was that hard attitude. Proverbs 23 verse 15 says, well, let's back up because... Let's read 12. This is good for the youngins. Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. So your ears are in it and your heart's in it. Withhold not correction from the child. 
For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. We're seeing a generation of people that have had parents that either were in a church or a modern version that removed verse 13 or totally altered it that doesn't mean what it says, that have never been told, no, you're wrong. You are confused. That is not right. And so now they're just running rampant on anything. You want to talk about deception and confusion? Look, I know we already parked on how bad it's going to get. But boy, oh boy, it seems like it's pretty, pretty bad right now, isn't it? You mean you're confused about two genders? That boy needs to be taken out or that girl needs to be taken out. And they should have had a spanking. Yeah. But instead, nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds are being encouraged by their parents to explore their gender identity. No, it's, it's absolutely from the depths of hell itself. Yeah. But you're a mean man and you're a mean woman if you were to dare spank your child. Ooh, don't do that. There's this new wave of parenting that's all it's all about gentleness and, and nurturing. And if, if little Billy doesn't want to come to the table to eat, well, don't force little Billy to eat. Let him let him do everything on his own time. If little Billy wants to wants to tease or smack or hit, don't you understand? Little Billy is feeling some emotions inside. We need to give little Billy some room. No, little Billy needs to be taken out back and get a little spanking. That's what little Billy needs. And little Billy needs to sit his little butt in the chair. And he needs to learn how to sit straight and not scream and not holler and eat his carrots and his peas. And if you don't want to eat them, he'll get hungry enough and come back and eat them. My dad wasn't confused. <laughs> I trust yours wasn't either. It was, this is what we're doing. Now this parenting has turned into, well, little Billy, what would you like to do? Little Billy is going to grow up and he's going to have a wicked heart because he was never taken out back to the woodshed, so to speak, and given a little spanking. Yeah. He's not going to die. Living for the devil, how some of these young people are, that's going to kill him. Living this queer, perverted lifestyle that they're promoting this month, that's going to kill people. Yeah. Spanking a child with a rod is not going to kill them. Now, I got to qualify this because if the Internet's watching, then they got everything on an algorithm now. I didn't say abusing a child. I didn't say punching a child. I didn't say elbow striking a child. I didn't say knee striking a child. I didn't say harming the child in any way. The spanking is causing surface pain so as to alarm the child into, whoa, I'm not in charge here. It is not to cause physical abusive harm that's wrong and that's just as much of the devil than the stuff we were just preaching against spanking is not hurting the child mm -hmm. it is verse 14 thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell well hell's that going to deliver him from hell well he's going to realize pain is associated with wrongdoing and if i keep sinning that sin is going to kill me. Sin brings pain. Because I'm a sinner, I'm separated from God, and it's right in there. The gospel's right. You can weave it right in there. As you're raising your children, teach them to understand sin hurts. It's going to hurt you bad. Anyway, verse 15. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice even mine. Yea, my reins shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Now you see the contrast. Who do we rejoice with? Your son. What are the reins? It's the inward affections. It's the heart. You rejoice with your son when he gets it right. Or your daughter when she gets it right. Who do you rejoice with? Your spouse? Who do you rejoice with? Your kids when they get it right. Do you see the contrast? God is not just about correct, correct, correct. Rod, rod, rod. 
He's about rejoice, rejoice, rejoice when the child gets it right. And too many Christian parents get it wrong because they're all about discipline. They're all about correction. They're all about rod. They know all those verses, but they forget the ones following. And isn't it neat? My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Your child have something good to say? They have something that they did right? Rejoice with them. Proverbs 23. And verse number 24. Father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. And he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. We have a lot of unwise children terrorizing our streets. Mm -hmm. And if you were to say something against it, they would just make it a systemic. You're systemically racist. You're systemically this. I, I don't know. I, I can't keep up with all the terms. I can't. And you probably can't either, but your child's doing right. Rejoice in that. Have joy with him and over him because of the right things he does. Proverbs 27. Proverbs chapter number 27, the Bible says in verse 9. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. It just gives me an allergy, quite honestly. <laughs> so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. You know who you should rejoice with? Your Christian friends. Those that give you some advice. Rejoice with your spouse. Rejoice with your children. Rejoice with your friend. Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 12. The Bible says, when righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, a man is hidden. Who should you rejoice with? Other righteous men. Find someone that's righteous. Rejoice with him. Hang out with him or her. Proverbs 29, verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. I know we're never going to have a completely righteous ruler like one that's a common, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is one of the reasons why I personally believe all Christians should vote. You have the freedom to do it. My God isn't Lady Liberty. I don't believe in American Christianity. It's We have brothers and sisters worldwide. But at the same time, I am thankful that I was born here. I am thankful for the freedoms that we have. Even though our founders were deists at best, Thomas Jefferson took all the morality of Jesus. He threw out the deity of Jesus. I don't believe these men were saved men. But nonetheless, the principles of the Bible, whether they are practiced by a heathen or not, are still biblical principles. So I do rejoice in the fact, and I am thankful that we have freedom to do this. Our Christianity would look very, very different in Iraq. Very different. We wouldn't be as bold as we are say we would be. Let's put it that way. So Try to vote for the most righteous person knowing that we'll never have somebody completely righteous. Knowing that we're not voting for a spiritual leader. We're not voting for a pastor. We're not voting for a grandparent. We're not voting for someone to babysit our children. But we are trying to get as much righteousness to prevail at least politically and economically. Now, that's all I have to say about that. And I realize you're never going to have a perfect candidate. And if you don't see it that way, that's fine. But if there's someone that's more righteous than someone else that wins, I'm rejoicing. <laughs> I'm glad Hillary didn't get it. Of course, I don't even think the president now even knows he's the president. But... <laughs> 
Did you, ever, did you ever get caught in the YouTube loop watching some of these things about Joe Biden? He, he can't even put a sentence together. <laughs> yeah. But there, you know, there it goes. I mean, probably should get off of that. All right, Proverbs 31, last one. Proverbs 31, verse number 25. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She shall rejoice in time to come. Look what it says here, this Proverbs 31 woman. She maketh herself, verse 22, coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. No, mine wears cotton and polyester. I don't know what yours wears. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she rejoice in time to come. Her husband's at the gate. I guess if you work that hard, you got that much going on. You know, <laughs> Your husband is just kind of sit, talk shop with the fellas, you know, solve all the problems down at Ralph's Donuts because she's, you know, managing the house. and all that. I, I don't know. But look, that's some that's a woman who is able to manage all the affairs and all the responsibilities that God has given her. And she looks forward to the future. Look at verse 25 and she shall rejoice in time to come. But it's not with this anxiety that she's looking forward. It is with a spirit of gladness and rejoicing. That's the Proverbs 31 woman. She's looking forward to the future with gladness and joy, not, not anxious over it. And we're only getting through one verse. This is. Next to Jesus. Is that what it is? <laughs> All right, let's go over to Ecclesiastes. One more page or two, and you should be there. Chapter number three. Ecclesiastes chapter number three, verse number 12. <clears throat> I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. Live a good life. Ecclesiastes three, verse 22. Wherefore, I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works. For that is his portion, for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Rejoice in your own work. Ecclesiastes 5, verse number 19. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. Rejoice in your own labor. Why? Because it's a gift from God. There's nothing worse than a, than a born again Christian, someone who has been saved by grace, really has a hold of what grace is, which is pretty easy to define through the Bible, not of works. <laughs> so anything you're going to bring to the table and say, God, that's works. Just forget it. God saves by his grace. If you've been born again, you've been saved by grace. It would be an awful testimony to the world if you didn't live a good life. Well, I'm saved. Oh, okay. But you didn't live a good life. Nobody believes you're saved. Or if they do, they don't want to be a Christian because that's how they think Christians live and they don't want to live like that. You ever hear stories about people that live a really good life or have lived a really good life, yet they were never saved? Go to Utah. I mean, those, yeah. those people live good lives. They've got successful businesses, happy families. It's not like you go in and the families are torn apart. No, they stick together. They're living a good life. They don't have the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're heading to a devil's hell, living a good life, having happy families. Wouldn't it be awful for someone that has the truth, the doctrine of the Bible, and to not live a good life and give a horrible testimony to the world? We ought not do that. We should rejoice in the fact that we can live a good life. Do your own work and your own labor. We saw why, because it's the gift 
It's from God. Thank God that he's allowed you to have the mind and the strength to be able to work. Well, we got through one verse in 1 Thessalonians. I wasn't planning to take that long, but let's do one more and I'll close. We'll finish up. We'll pick up a little more steam next Thursday night. But Ecclesiastes 1st chapter 11. I hope you got some practical stuff out of this. I, I got a lot out of the study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was good. Um, last one. We'll close with Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse number 8. But if a man live many years, and rejoice in them all. Yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. And walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Everything in this world's vain. If you've got sorrow in your heart. If you've got evil. That your flesh is doing. You're not going to run out of steam doing it because you're not young forever. You can't run with the boys forever. I remember being 19, 20, 21, 22, unsaved, all the energy in the world. Thought I was going to do all these different things. Did some of them. Now, I can't do half the stuff. You lose your energy. You lose the, you know, it's the fight drive to want to really go after. Still want to live for God. I want to go all out for Him. And any sorrow in your heart, any evilness, put it away. It's all vanity. All that type of emotion, it's all vanity. It's not from God. Get a hold of some rejoicing. All the stuff that we went through tonight, all those verses that we read, get a hold of that. That's not going to be vain. That's going to be something that's going to be eternally rewarded. You rejoicing, singing, shouting for the Lord. Let's all remember that this week. Mm -hmm.